In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to set up a basic compute shader in Godot 4 by converting the score calculation from my last video on Splatoon's ink gun into a compute shader. As always, any scripts you see on the screen, I'm going to leave in paste bins down below and any resources I use, I'll also link in the description. If you don't know what a compute shader is, there are a special type of shader that lets us run calculations on the GPU and get the results back. They're useful because graphics cards are fantastic at running many operations in parallel, so we can compute things very quickly that will take the CPU a long time to perform. Let's start by running over the minimum possible compute shader. It looks like a lot, but it's just a lot of boilerplate code and it's not so bad once you get used to it. So we'll start by setting up the rendering device. This is like our hook into the graphics card. It's what we're going to use to pretty much do everything. Then we create our shader. You'll notice that we're loading an actual GLSL file. That's how we write compute shaders in Godot 4. Uh, we also set up the pipeline. Here we're creating our input data. So in compute shaders, everything gets sent across to the GPU in byte arrays. So get used to this. Here we're setting up our storage buffer. Storage buffers are a special type of uniform that lets us um, put data into the compute shader and then pull data back out of it as well. Um, very useful, um, as you'll see. Here's where we're setting up the uniform so it can be sent over to the shader. Then we're creating our compute list. This is like our list of instructions to the GPU. We create a uniform set with the uniforms that we're passing over to it. Then we set up our dispatch. I'll get onto this later on um, what this is and why it's important. And then we finish up our list and submit it to the graphics card. And at that point, it will start plowing along and doing its thing. And then sync basically gets the CPU to wait until it's done. Ideally, you wouldn't do this right away. You could wait a couple of frames while the GPU does its thing and then sync on it later. Um, but yeah, just a minimum possible example. Um, finally, we get back out the data. So as you'll see, we're using a storage buffer again because we can put data in and then pull data back out of it. And then we decode the byte array. The compute shader is very simple. All it's doing is it's taking in this storage buffer that we set up earlier, and then it's setting the data at the index of the global invocation, which again, I'll get onto later, um, to be the value of the global invocation. So what are invocations and what are work groups? Well, dispatch here is setting up our work groups. Work groups are like collections of invocations that can't talk to each other. So you need to make sure in your logic, you don't rely on work groups being able to communicate. Invocations are similar to work groups, but they can talk to each other. They're local to the work group and they can communicate between themselves. So your logic can make use of that. So here, um, we've got three numbers a two a one and a one as i said earlier gpus are fantastic at running things in parallel so we've got three dimensions here um x y and a z so we're, we've got two work groups on the x-axis one on the y one on the z so essentially we've got two work groups total then inside our invocation we have eight on the x one on the Y and one on the Z. So that means we've got two work groups and each work group will have eight invocations, making a global invocation count of 16. Hopefully that makes sense. So what is the global invocation ID? The global invocation ID is a variable that we get access to, which is a unique ID for all invocations across all work groups. It's one of the ways that we can distribute our data that we want to process across our different work groups and invocations. There's a few more that you get access to here, but I found the global invocation one to be more than enough for the uh, basic shader that I'm going to show you in a minute. So now that we've gone through the minimum basic possible compute shader, let's create one that actually does something. So here I'm going to convert the score calculation from the last video on Splatoon's ink gun into a compute shader. So the original logic is as follows. We just loop over the X and Y values, count the pixels, and then print out the results. It was cheap and easy to set up, but it ran very slowly, so I had to pull it up in a separate thread. I think it takes about half a second each time to calculate, so we could do a lot better in a compute shader. So let's begin by setting up our compute shader. So create a new GLSL file and then put the compute header and the version on the top. Then we're going to set up our invocations. So to keep the shader simple, I'm going to have each global invocation run on one pixel at a time. 
And the way I'm going to do that is that each work group will have eight X and eight Y local invocations. And then I'm going to have 256 X work groups and 256 Y work groups. And that makes a total of 2048 by 2048, which is the same resolution as our example texture. Um, and it seems to run quite quickly in my testing. So that worked for me. So after that, let's set up our storage buffer. Uh, this is exactly the same as in the demo, but I'm going to use an interray instead. And we're going to have zero be the red pixels and one be the blue pixel. Then we need to pass our texture into it. And we do that just like any other shader. We just create a sample 2D uniform. Now we can set up our main logic. And again, I'm keeping this very simple. This isn't going to be the fastest way to handle this, but it's still much quicker than the original code and it gets the point across the compu shaders. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the global X and Y invocation IDs to sample our texture. And we're going to check the pixels for both red and blue color. And if it sees any, then we are going to use the atomic add. So if you know anything about multi-threading, having multiple threads accessing the data at the same time is always a big no-no. You haven't, it just creates undefined behavior. Atomic add is going to block on each operation so that it gets added in before another thread on this compute shader can then add to it. This does mean that this isn't the fastest way to handle this, but it still works for our purposes. And then we just got to do the same again for our blue channel. And that's literally our compute shader done. So now that we've got our GLS cell shader out of the way, let's get the Godot side set up. So I'm just going to be slightly modifying the minimum compute shader that we set up before. So start by getting in our rendering device. Then we just need to set up our shader. So we load the file directly and then we get the Spurv? Spurvy? I don't know how you pronounce it. Let me know in the comments. Um, and then set up the pipeline. Then we're going to want to set up our storage buffer so that we can get our results back out after. So we'll create a packed interray and just initialize it to 00, zero so our red count and our blue count. Pass that into the buffer. Then we need to create our uniform for the buffer. So we use rduniform.new to create our uniforms. Um, this will be the same for the texture layer as well. Set the uniform type storage buffer. Make sure that the binding matches the binding in your storage buffer uniform on the GLSL code. It's very important that they match. And then finally, you add the buffer by calling add ID. So in this example project, I'm just passing in a predefined red and blue splattered texture to test the code. So I just load, load it as any other texture. But we do, as I said before, need to pass everything over as um, packed byte arrays. So we can call get data to get that. Let me just quickly set up a variable for the texture. So now we need to set up the uniform for the texture. And this is where it got a bit tricky for me with a lack of documentation that's currently out there on this. So first we need to create an RD texture format. And this needs to match the format of our texture. So Create the RD texture format object, set the width and height to the same as our texture. I've just hard coded it for now, but you should probably use the texture size. Then we need to set the usage bits. So we need to set can update bit and our sampling bit because we're going to be sampling the texture. Um, if you know anything about bitwise operations or just combines these flags together, both of these need to be set or we can't pass the texture along to our compute shader. Also very important is that we need to set the data format to be the same data format as the image. This is something that you can't set on import in Godot. It's just, just done automatically for you. So as you can see here in the corner, this image is RGBA8. If there was no transparent pixels in the background, it would just be RGB8. So just make sure that you check what it is here and then you set the corresponding data format here. Otherwise it won't work you'll just get gibberish out and you won't know why. Finally, we can create our texture. We have to use a rendering device to do this. Here's what the call looks like. So we just create our variable called create, pass in our format, pass in a texture view. I didn't really need to do anything special here. I just used the default new and it worked. Then we have to pass in our image data in a packed byte array. Um, I had to wrap it in an array as well for this. I'm not sure why. 
when there's documentation i'm sure i'll find out then we also need to set up our sampler because it's a sampler with a texture in it so here i create a new rd sampler i set the state to unnormalized this is so i can use pixel coordinates to access the data rather than having to use normalized zero to one floating point values and then create that finally we can set up our texture uniform for this set the type to sampler with texture make sure the binding matches as with the storage buffer and then first you're going to want to add the sampler and then add the texture it seemed to make a difference for some reason when i did it the other way around locally and then finally we can create our uniform set again with the other ones make sure that the set id matches the set id listed in the in the layout on your compute shader after that it's just a matter of executing the compute shader as i mentioned before i'm doing 256 by 256 on the x and y um, so here I'm just making that easy by dividing our um, pixel amount by the amount of evocations that we're using. And finally we can get out our results. So get the data out of the buffer, uh, convert it into a int 32 array and then we can print it. And yeah, that's that. So here's a quick test project I set up just to compare and contrast the times it takes for both the CPU method and the GPU method to execute as well as just check the results make sense. So if I hit the calculate CPU button, it's going to run the original algorithm where we count each pixel um, through a for loop. And then if I hit calculate GPU, it's going to run the compute shader. So let's see how long they take. Let's start with the CPU. So as you can see, it took about half a second and those are the counts it got for red and blue pixels. Let's compare it to the GPU. So that took 21 milliseconds, a hell of a lot quicker. Um, if I run it a few times, yeah, so it, it went up then, it went down to 11. I think it's because I'm recording. It seems to take an average of about eight milliseconds when I run it without recording. Um, and yeah, you can see the results match. So it's working and it's much quicker, significantly faster. And just quickly, here's the final score calculation compute shader logic that I used in the Splatoon demo at the beginning. So in ready, I'm setting up a lot of the boilerplate because we don't need to do it every single frame or every single time we call the score calculation just saving them all in variables at the top and then in our actual thread I've kept it multi-threaded just to make sure there's no extra blocking happening even though it only takes about 10 milliseconds it's still worth having that on a separate thread um, the only real thing we need to do inside here is just update the texture and we can do that using texture update and then rerunning our compute list and then finally, we just pull out the results and update our score. I think that's going to do it for this video. If you found it useful or you like the video, please subscribe. It took a lot of trial and error because there is no, there is just no documentation out there at the moment for this. Um, if there's any other topics or ideas you want to see explored in a tutorial video, please drop a, an idea in the comment section below and I'll get around to it. Thank you very much. Cheers.